to the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for today and beyond in this broadcast of Foundational Fringe, Myths, Legends, Supernatural, and the Paranormal in the Biblical Text. And I am Dr. S.W. Kibler, and I am so happy that you have chosen to view this video. We're going to continue the series, UFOs and Extraterrestrials in the Biblical Text, and this is part two. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned in the first video in this series, the term UFO and extraterrestrials do not occur in the Biblical Text, but flying objects and beings from out of this world are mentioned quite often. And we're going to look at another hard-to-believe account in the Biblical Text. But as I say, the truth is the truth whether we want to believe it or not. But knowing the whole truth helps us to better understand the realities of this universe that Yahweh created and the realities of the times in which we live and which are coming. By using the Word of God to interpret strange and often unexplainable occurrences that we are facing today and will face will help us to have a clear understanding of what the heck is going on and then how to appropriately deal with these realities and deal with them in a way that is honoring and acceptable to our Lord, our Savior, Yeshua. So we're going to look today at the biblical text that tells us about the prophet Elijah and an experience that he had and was witnessed by. Okay, there was a witness. And this has so many similarities to last week's uh, lesson when we looked at Ezekiel's experience. Right? So let's go ahead and let's jump into the biblical text right now. And we are in 2 Kings chapter 2. And we'll be looking at uh, just several of the verses beginning with uh, verse 1. And then we'll jump down a little bit. Now, this is English Standard Version, of course. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And as they went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. So we're just going to look at this particular piece right here. Um, and this is uh, verse 11 and 12. It says, they still went on and talked. They were walking and they were talking. And behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. So whatever this was came in between Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Now, Elijah was a prophet. Uh, in the Hebrew, his name is uh, Eliyahu, which means Yahweh is my God. So he was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reigns of King Ahab and Ahaziah. And you can find that in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Uh, the ending of 1 Kings and the beginning of 2 Kings. So you're right. Remember that Elijah had a run-in with prophets of Baal, with 450 of them, and there was a quite spectacular events that took place there and he uh, had the 450 uh, prophets of Baal uh, killed and uh, that didn't set well with Jezebel uh, and so she was out to murder him and uh, so there's quite a lot of spiritual battle that, that took place in uh, Elijah's life and now this is the end Right? But he doesn't die. He's one of two people in the biblical text that we're told did not die. The first is Enoch. says he simply walked no more. He walked with God and then was no more. He just 
disappeared. And then here with Elijah, he's caught up into heaven. Okay. So that kind of sets the stage. Here we go. And as they were walking, so the, uh, Elijah and Elisha were walking, and something came between them. In the biblical text, the way that, that it is translated and worded in English says chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. Okay, so sometimes, and we looked at this last week, we look at something like this and we say, oh, well, God did it. Big deal. Right? Or... It's just a Bible story and it really didn't happen. Well, it's in the biblical text and you can't pick and choose what you want to believe. This is what the biblical text says. So this is, this event happened. It's not a story. It's a fact. It's reality. Now, as we do, we're going to take a closer look, right? So we're looking at this word here and this is uh, Rakeb and that's the word for chariot. But that's the way it was translated into English. But in the Hebrew, it simply means a vehicle. It doesn't necessarily mean a chariot. It means a vehicle. So some type of vehicle was there. Okay. And uh, we might think that it was a chariot or want to believe it was a chariot, but we're not told it was a chariot. We're told it was a vehicle. Now, if you want to say chariot, that would be what they were familiar with in that historical context, right? But it's, it's the same we use today. We would say, oh yeah, um, uh, you have, uh, governments have departments of, right, for vehicles. Department of Translation, Motor Vehicle Administration, right? We use that term vehicle, and it doesn't just mean a car or a Volkswagen or a motorcycle. It's a vehicle. That's what the word means in Hebrew. Right, heb. Vehicle. So, some sort of vehicles appeared, and they appeared to be flaming or have flames coming from the vehicle. That's what it says. So, as far as the horses of fire, uh, that's a parash in the Hebrew, and it can mean a horse, but it also is often used to designate the driver, the person driving, right? It's not horses or horsemen, it's actually the people driving. Whatever the vehicle was, they ha it had a driver in it. Or you might uh, speculate a pilot. So this term, uh, uh, parash, can also be used for equipment or uh, of war or for strong men. It's kind of funny, it's kind of how we use the word stud today to refer to a, to a, a man or a guy. Well, that kind of was used then too, Paul Rasha, stud, you know, he's a strong man. He's, I don't think that's what it means here. It could, but I think it really means a driver or someone piloting or driving that vehicle. Okay. So if we just use the, the words, and then we use other English words, right, to translate the Hebrew. Very likely, it could say that flaming vehicles appeared and there were drivers or pilots for those vehicles. In basics, that's what the text says. Now, you may think that's hard to believe. I don't. I don't think that's hard to believe because this is a supernatural event that's taking place. And uh, all of the artwork that I've seen has the chariots flaming and, and horses flaming. And then it has Elijah in the chariot being taken to heaven. But that's not what the biblical text says either. See, we need to realize we often let songs, words for songs, even hymns, that we have sung in church and religious art. We allow those things to make impressions upon our, our mind, our brains, our minds, right? And, and we use those to interpret scripture. But what we have to realize is all words to songs in all religious art are not accurate. They're just artists who are making 
pictures. There is no photographic evidence of what actually took place. This is just what people have wanted to believe and have painted pictures or they have wrote words to songs because they rhyme. So we need to be careful that we don't let words of songs become doctrine or instructional for us. And we should not allow religious art to impress us that that is the reality. It's just art. It's all it is. What the scripture tells us, the biblical text tells us, is that Elijah was caught up. Never says he got on the, in that vehicle. It says that he was raised up. He was caught up. Elijah was not carried away by the vehicles. It's very clear. The biblical text says that he was lifted up. And that term means he was personally lifted up. Right? So, it says in a whirlwind. Now, the word in Hebrew for whirlwind is Sahar, Sahar, and it means a strong storm, a tempest, hurricane, tornado, right? It's not a dust devil. <laughs> we live in Arizona and we have a lot of dust devils here. That's not what this is. Where I live in Arizona, the wind blows often strong and often, but that's not the Sahar. It's a tempest, a strong storm, a hurricane. So, <clears throat> picture in your mind a strong storm that's coming in, a hurricane. You've seen videos of hurricanes if you haven't been in one yourself. Or the storms that bring along tornadoes. I mean, there are things that they all have in common. Clouds and wind. That's what this means. So are clouds and wind, tempest, strong storm. And this is the same word, Sa'ar, so that's used in Ezekiel that we looked at last week. Ezekiel 1, verse 4. So I'm going to pull that right up there. And this is, again, English Standard Version. As I looked, behold, a storm, a stormy wind, Sa'ar, so came out of the north, great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire as it were gleaming metal. So, that's the word that's used. In Ezekiel, they use stormy wind and that has clouds attached to it, right? In 2 Kings with Elijah, they decided to use the word whirlwind. Why? I'm not sure, but it really means a strong storm, a tempest, like a hurricane or a tornado. So, that's what caught Elijah up. He went up in this storm into the clouds. That's the insinuation. He was caught up and went into the clouds and disappeared from sight. Elisha watched Elijah being lifted up and ascending to the heaven and disappear. That's what the text says. Disappeared. So, although the word cloud is not mentioned in the text involving Elijah, it seems it is definitely implied because of the Sa'ar, right? The storm, hurricane, tornado. It's implied. And when you think about it, now let's think about this. We already have this evidence in Ezekiel, uh, with uh, Ezekiel, with the storm, the storm, the wind, and the clouds. And it seems it's evident here as well, that it includes not only a storm and wind, but clouds. Right? That's what the word means. So this corresponds with a lot of other pieces of biblical text, specifically in the New Testament. And that's what we're going to look at now, because I think that when you see these, these verses in the New Testament, you can attach them and apply them to what we have just seen last week with Ezekiel, and this week with Elijah. Okay, you ready? Here we go. So we're going to look first here at Matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 5. And this is speaking of Yeshua. It says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud, a bright, cl a radiant, shining cloud, 
overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Okay. So here, now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, says, And then, sh and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man, how? Coming in the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> Coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So that's a specific term. It's not the clouds in heaven or in the sky. It's the clouds of, from, the clouds from heaven, of heaven, right? with great power. So how is Yeshua returning? In the clouds from heaven. So we have these clouds that we see in the Old Testament in the account of Ezekiel and Elijah. And now we're seeing the same type of language in the New Testament. So there's another verse here, and this is in Matthew as well, chapter 26, verse 64. It says, Jesus said unto him, you have said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Coming in the clouds of heaven, from heaven. So, there is a distinction between regular clouds and the clouds of heaven. So, we see that in the Old Testament and we see that here in the New Testament. And one more New Testament piece of the biblical text. And again, uh, this one is English Standard. I think I had English Standard on the on the screen there, and I was reading from the King James. But this is Acts chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 9. It says, And when he had said these things, this is after his death, burial, and resurrection, and he was talking with the disciples, and this is about his ascension, the ascension of Yeshua. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. Same phraseology, although in Greek, but it's the same phraseology that's used in 2 Kings with Elijah. He was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. I really believe that was a cloud from heaven, not just a cumulus cloud that was floating around. And while they were gazing into heaven... As he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Oh, all of a sudden they just appeared. Think about that. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. Right? So now we have this consistency about clouds taking people up and bringing the Lord. The cloud brought the Lord in the text of uh, Ezekiel. And here, the cloud caught up Yeshua just in a similar way that we read about Elijah being lifted up or caught up. And how was Yeshua returning? In the cloud. So this is very consistent in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. So are we to expect that Yeshua is going to return in any other manner other than what the biblical text tells us. I don't think so. I think we're be, being given clues of what this is. Now, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it's going to be rather awesome. We have recorded in the biblical text regarding Ezekiel and Elijah and in the New Testament, uh, the Gospels, and in the book of Acts. This is all supernatural. Supernatural events that will cause marvel when the Lord returns, Yeshua comes back. It will be so spectacular and such a supernatural event that it will cause everyone to marvel and great fear will seize the people. Those that are left on the earth, they will see it and it's going to be supernatural. Now there's a lot that's not told about what happened to the vehicles uh, like with Elijah, but it seems the they just appeared. That's what the text said. They appeared between them. They separated uh, Elijah from Elisha. They appeared. Well, it doesn't say they flew down. It doesn't say they 
descended from heaven or floated down or flew down. It doesn't say that they flew back up in the whirlwind. Nothing is mentioned about that. It's just they weren't there and then they were and then they weren't. These vehicles, right? The fiery chariots, the fiery vehicles. They weren't there, then they were, then they weren't. Right? So it seems that this is relatively important. <clears throat> if we're going to understand, you know, I, I've used the word technology, right? This technology that, that Yahweh has, these vehicles, but it's whatever you want to call it. But it's evident that this is another appearance of a reality that's not part of this world, at least as we know it. Okay, this is something supernatural. It's it's out of this world. There are those who believe UFOs are from uh, other galaxies, right? Far, far away. However, the vehicles that are mentioned here in the biblical text are not from another galaxy. Last week with Ezekiel or this week with Elijah, they're not from another galaxy, right? These vehicles are not extra galactical but they are extra dimensional that is from another dimension it's the only only explanation for something that can appear and disappear it's a different dimension they're, they're from a different dimension and it's a dimension that's beyond what we experience here on earth this length height width and time that's how we live and that's how we experience this world Right? But there are other dimensions, other dimensions than the ones that we can experience. This ability to appear and disappear is out of this world, literally. But it is consistent, you know, with sightings of UFOs. That it's there, then it's gone. And also the this extra dimensional uh, abilities of the UFOs uh, sightings that uh, make uh, 90 degree angle turns without stopping and traveling at thousands of miles an hour that's out of this world it's different dimension right different dimension it's just not a location they're from a different location to from a different dimension that is the best explanation even of physicists right so let's look at another familiar verse and this is out of the, the uh, Gospel of Luke, and it's, verse, it's 24. I'm just going to read it in an English Standard Version. And this is after the resurrection of Christ. You remember, he met two men. And they were walking on the road to Emmaus, and he was walking with them and talking with them. So, so they drew near to the village in which they were going, and uh, Yeshua acted as though he was still going to continue walking, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. He was there, and then he wasn't. Extra dimensional. Right? A different dimension than where now that he can exist. And there's more. A little later in verse 36, it says, now that these were the disciples and they were behind closed doors because they were afraid. And it says, as they were talking about these things, about the trial and the crucifixion, and the disappearance, the resurrection of Christ, right? So as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. He wasn't there. And then he was. And then he said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened as though they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do your doubts arise in your heart? See, my hands, my feet, <clears throat> that is, I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So, Yeshua, Jesus, after his death, burial, resurrection, he could appear and then he could disappear, right? But he still had some type of physical reality because 
he spoke, and he would eat. This is supernatural stuff here, right? This is supernatural stuff. So we see this ability to appear and disappear. We see that happening in uh, uh, other biblical texts in the Old Testament when the, the word of the Lord appears. He's not there, and then he is. And then we see the same thing with the flaming vehicles and their pilots. They weren't there, and then they were, and then they weren't, just appearing and disappearing. So this is a supernatural thing, and it's not restricted to just Yeshua, but it is um, consistent with beings who are extra-dimensional. Okay. So extra-dimensional is a reality. Right? The resurrected Yeshua was no longer confined to the natural laws that we find ourselves slave to on this earth. There are other dimensions. And that's important for us to understand. Because one of those dimensions is where we call heaven. Heaven is not a different location. It is a different dimension. Right? There are not GPS coordinates to heaven. But it exists, and it exists in a different dimension. And to reside there requires the ability to exist in a different dimension. One of those dimensions is spiritual. But there is also another dimension, and that is the dimension of the resurrected body in heaven it requires a different body. So 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 40 reads this way, English Standard Version. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies. Now, the word heavenly bodies, it's referring to uh, a tent, uh, like the temple, tabernacle, this thing. There's the earthly, there's an earthly body, but then there's a heavenly body. And it's different than the earthly body. Look, the glory of the heavenly is of one kind. And the glory of the earthly is of another. They're not the same. The heavenly body can exist in other dimensions than these four that we experience on earth. Then 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. New body. I think this is one of the reasons that unsaved will not be able to ever enter into heaven because it is a different dimension and you need a different body to reside there in the final state. Okay, right now we're told that when we when a, per, a, a believer dies, uh, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there's some uh, spiritual reality, but they're not in a body. Right? They're not in a body. They're in the spirit. But at the rapture, we are told that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those of us who are left behind will join them and meet them uh, in the air and meet the Lord and we will be with him forever and ever and ever. So there's a change that takes place and uh, we're pretty sure that it's after rapture because if it wasn't, why resurrect the dead bodies, right? So a body such as Yeshua's resurrection body, that's what's necessary to for a human to dwell in another dimension, the dimension of heaven. The unsaved body will not be that. There will be a resurrection, but they won't be changed. There will not be the imperishable aspect of that body. 
it will be able to be tormented and perish because it is fit to suffer the second death and for the torment in the lake of fire. There's hope. There's hope in Yeshua. 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. Ah, speaking of that change, right? That new body. It's going to be different. It's a heavenly body. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like because it has not yet appeared, but it's going to happen. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Speaking of Yeshua. So that resurrected body that Yeshua is in possession of, that can live in different dimensions and can appear and disappear, right? We will be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him, that's your hope. The future, the real future is in Yeshua. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Well, we need to stop here. And I hope this has been a lightning and informative study of the biblical text. At least maybe causing you to think about how awesome Yahweh is. So we've covered a lot about uh, extra dimensions, uh, the ability to appear and disappear, uh, clouds, fiery vehicles, right? Uh, Elijah being caught up very similar to the way that uh, Yeshua was caught up into the clouds. So what we do see is there is absolute consistency from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And what we have in the Old Testament, right, is revealed in the New Testament. This is absolute truth of the biblical text. So, we just thank you and hope to see you next time on the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for today and beyond. Foundational Fringe, Myths, Legends, Supernatural, and the Paranormal in the Biblical Text. And remember, always know the truth, stand on the truth, and speak the truth. God bless you.